I'd just like to say thank you to Robin Arvet for, for hosting us this evening. Also thanks to Pedigree. Pedigree are, are very committed to education, not just of vets and nurses, but of the general public as well, and, and I really do applaud their efforts. Um, and thanks to you all for, for tuning in to listen. Um, I know when you've finished a hard day's work, it is very hard to sit down and do more studying, so thank you for, for tuning in. Um, I, I love talking about dental radiography and radiology because it's, it's a beautiful subject. I love taking um, radiographs of teeth because I never quite know what I'm going to see. Um, there are some beautiful things to be seen out there, and certainly if you're doing a lot of dentistry, you, you need to be taking radiographs. And I think the number of people that are taking dental radiographs is rapidly increasing, um, and I can gauge that when I go to universities and, and uh, ask the students how many have seen vets taking dental radiographs, and also when I sort of run uh, ProSCADRA at CPD courses. So my rough estimate at the moment is about a, a third of practices are, are using dental radiography, but maybe a, a year or two ago it was only about 25%. So I think it's exponentially growing. So what I'd like to cover tonight is how you can take dental radiographs, and then once you've learned how to take them, how do I actually interpret what I'm seeing. So it is an essential tool in veterinary dentistry, and I, I can remember the days before I started taking radiographs, and then when I did start taking radiographs, my approach to dentistry dramatically changed. Um, it's not a, a cost prohibitive thing to provide to clients, um, depending on where you are. Um, the practices that I work from, we charge out our first radiograph maybe about £15, something like that and subsequent ones may be about £10. So it doesn't add a huge amount to the client's bill, but it adds an enormous amount in terms of what you can do in terms of diagnosing disease and also treating the disease, um, and then also explaining to your client what's, what's going on. This cat is a fairly good example um, of a case that, that I saw. The referring vet had extracted the lower third premolar um, a week or so prior to me seeing it, but the extraction site had not healed, and the tooth was extracted because it was mobile. And they didn't have dental radiography, so when I anesthetized the cat, the first thing I did was to just examine the mouth and then take a radiograph. Um, and this is what we saw on the radiograph, or rather what I should say is what you can't see, um, and that's really any, any mandibular bone of any sorts at all. This is an extremely um, osteolytic process that's going on here, and we can see resorption of the bone, and not only in the cortex, but in the the body of the mandible, um, and there's also resorption in the apical part of that canine uh, tooth root. And the most likely diagnosis there is, is a squamous cell carcinoma that um, is, is very aggressive and, and tends to invade bone. So it does really enhance what the client um, perceives and understands about the disease in their pet, and they, they do get an enhanced sense of value for money, and it really is the gold standard in patient care. In this x-ray alone, this is a dog's mandible, um, we can see numerous pathologies just in one x-ray. Um, we can see um, bone loss, we can see internal resorption in the first molar tooth, we can see periodontal disease changes, and we can see some kind of um, abscess or granuloma forming around one of the roots of the molar tooth. So I could potentially talk to the client for about 20 minutes on this, this one x-ray. So rather than just saying to the client, well, I took these two teeth out, I can actually explain why I took these teeth out because of the disease that's there. And in my experience, clients are very visual people. They, they understand things if you show them what's going on. And really, everybody wins when you take dental radiographs. The patient obviously benefits because you can detect more disease and you can treat it correctly. The client perceives better value for money. And if you take um, dental radiographs, you will actually profit from it as well. The practice will gain financially. You will pay off and, and uh, pay off your investment in a very short period of time, and you will actually perform better standards of dentistry, and you'll get more, you know, a sense of, of reward from doing your job properly. So the reason we need to take dental radiographs is we can only visually assess the crown of the tooth. So it literally is like the tip of an iceberg. We can't see the root, we can't see the periodontal ligament or the alveolar bone, and we can only see that with dental radiographs. So this type of x-ray, unfortunately, is no good for me when I'm looking at teeth. I can tell you that this is a cat, and it has some teeth in its mouth, and that's really the extent of, of um, what I can glean from that x-ray. There's far too much superimposition um, and relatively poor definition to be able to make any judgments. 
there are many indications. Um, one of them is before we perform an extra. like it's kind of got a double crown. And if I were to need to extract that tooth, I really have no idea how many roots are there. There may be one, there may be two, three, or potentially four roots. Kind of formed this double crown with three roots there. And you can see hopefully that the Muted. Um, lytic changes in the bone around that um, tooth consistent with periodontitis. So when I extract this tooth, I can see exactly where I need to section it into three pieces. And there are a surprising number of teeth that have an, not an odd number of roots, but perhaps where we're expecting two roots, we see three, or where we're expecting to see two roots, we perhaps see one. So in the, the top left-hand x-ray, this is a, a cat's maxilla. It's the third premolar. And Frank Vestrata did a lovely paper about um, uh, 12, 14 years ago now where he looked at anatomical variations. And we know that in cats, 10% of the time, this tooth will have a third root. And if you're extracting cat's teeth, perhaps for gingerostomatitis, it's really important that you get all of the roots out. We can also make a judgment on um, how alive a tooth is. Um, in the left-hand x-ray, hopefully you can see within the canine tooth at the top, we've got a fairly narrow black line, which is the, the pulp within the tooth, the soft tissues, the nerves and blood vessels. In the corresponding tooth at the bottom, the, the pulp space is much wider. And we can also see some resorption around the root tip there. And that would tell me that that tooth has died, and the pulp is dead, so it can't stimulate continued dentine deposition within the tooth. And similarly, in the x-ray on the right-hand side, the pulp space is very, very wide. If you compare it to the pulp space within the first and second premolars, the pulp space there is much narrower. So in an older dog, this uh, Bimoranum was nine, that pulp space is very, very wide. And that tells me that the tooth has died and, and stopped developing. So in a, in a young animal, in an immature tooth, the pulp space is very wide, and the dentinal walls are very thin. Um, and that's relevant when you're performing extractions, because these teeth are very, very delicate, or if you're, you're extracting persistent deciduous teeth. So as the tooth matures, um, as long as the pulp is alive, the pulp will actually stimulate continued dentine deposition. So the pulp gradually gets smaller as dentine is laid down, and then the apex of the root is formed as well. So in an older animal, this is the kind of x-ray we, we would expect to see. Tooth resorption, I don't need to tell you, if any of you do feline dentistry, how common this is. And certainly research will put the figure anywhere between 35 and 65 percent of all cats in their lifetime will, will suffer from this. Now, there are two specific forms of resorption. Um, the, the current sort of accepted terminology is just tooth resorption. Um, we used to refer to it as feline odontoclastic resorptive lesions, which is obviously a bit of a, a mouthful, and we prefer the acronym for but you will see in current literature just tooth resorption. But there are two types. One is um, a, a resorption of the tooth substance and then replacement by bone. So the tooth literally starts to disappear and is replaced by bone. Um, and then in the other type, the type 1, we see resorption within the tooth, but the tooth root is still there. And this will alter how you treat the cat. Because in the type 1 lesion, which is on the right, the entire root or roots need to be fully extracted. Alter um, alternatively, if it's a type 2, which is the x-ray on the left, that's the type of case where we can perform a crown amputation, because literally there is no, no root substance there. So we can perform a crown amputation with that type, but only after we've made the judgment with radiography. So this is the typical kind of image that you will see clinically, um, this third premolar is typically the first tooth that is affected. Um, Cecilia Garrell did a lovely paper in JSAP a few years ago now, and, and this is what we would call a sentinel tooth, um, because this seems to be the first tooth that is affected. And you see that, that classical enamel defect um, in the crown of the tooth, and then the gingiva tends to kind of grow up over it in an inflamed um, fashion. But until we take the x-ray, we really don't know what type of resorption is happening. And in this case, 
When we take the x-ray, we can see it's at the type 2. There literally is no root substance left. It's been resorbed by the body 